Hello and welcome to this Association of Corporate Treasurers webinar, where today we'll be hearing from a rating agency about how it's responding to ESG and what it can mean for you. So what is ESG? Um, it stands for Environment, Social and Governance, and it's in all the headlines today, these days, uh, whether it's the general news about Extinction Rebellion or it's in the financial press with comments from Mark Carney, it's a story that's going to have a long way to run. The attention of policymakers and regulators has resulted in a number of initiatives already, including the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, uh, commonly known as TCFD, the Principles for Responsible Investment, it's got over 2,500 signatories, uh, most of the leading asset managers, and the Equator Principles for Project Finance. So there's a lot going on from a regulatory perspective. The Treasury community itself is recognizing the importance of ESG, and we see innovations from companies such as Anglian Water, who are the first UK utility to issue a green bond, and from Thames Water, who have an innovative twist to their revolving credit facility with a green element to it. The ACT itself is playing its part with a special section in the Deals of the Year Award, a series of articles in the Treasurer, both the printed and the web edition, a podcast last month on green finance, with uh, accounting for sustainability and angling water, and a number of blogs on the topic as well. One of the key challenges impeding genuine progress is around building consistency around the definitions of ESG activities, how they're labeled, and how they're reported on. Rating agencies have implicitly included material ESG risks historically, but have had to see um, from their criteria exactly how this subset of risks influence credit. And today we're delighted to welcome two directors from Fitch Ratings, one of the big three rating agencies, to help us understand ESG, how ESG plays into your business. So you'll see a button on your screen that allows you to submit questions. We'd like this session to be as interactive as possible, so don't wait until the end, but please submit questions as we go through and we'll endeavor to cover off as many as we can. If you do ask a question, we will not mention your name or company, so do feel free to be as honest as you can be. Now, before we start, I'd like to make some introductions. My, my name is Naresh Agarwal. I'm one of the policy uh, technical directors here at the ACT. And I've spent over 30 years working in Treasury, and I'm delighted to welcome today Andrew Steele and Mervyn Tang from the Sustainable Finance part of Moody's. Fitch Ratings, please. Sorry. Right. <laughs> uh, from Fitch Ratings. Andrew has over 30 years of experience as a global risk and finance specialist and was recently appointed to lead a new cross-sector global team to develop and expand Fitch's analysis of ESG and sustainable finance. He is responsible for developing Fitch's sustainable finance strategy, both in the ratings business and across the broader Fitch group, by determining investor and banker needs and driving the development of new teams to provide products and services this rapidly growing area. Sounds very exciting and very challenging, Andrew. And joining us from Hong Kong, we have Mervyn Tang, who is a senior director and global head of ESG research at Fitch Ratings Sustainable Finance Division. Okay, thank you very much, Naresh. Um, well, we thought we'd start off by giving you um, something of an overview and um, to talk a little bit about, well, you know, what's all the fuss about when it comes to, to ESG. I mean, an important factor to remember when people talk about ESG is they often talk about it as if it's some kind of new risk category that's emerged from nowhere. But our, our view, and I think the, the view of most people um, who've experienced of investing and looking at ESG, is that these are risks which generally have always been, already been present, and subcategorizing them and separating them out to clearly display which aspects relate to environmental, which relate to social, and which relate to governance, is really just a different way of approaching investment and investment strategies. Um, so the risks are already there, but maybe this is a different way of categorizing and, and looking at those particular risks. Now, I, I put a little quote in here um, to start from, from the, uh, the, the sage of Omaha, um, Mr. Buffett himself, which says, companies that do harm to stakeholders are not likely to be good long-term investments. You as treasury professionals, I'm sure, are all aware of that and the consequences that can arise from that. But when it comes to 
environmental, social, and governance factors, what has been driving the increased interest in this particular subcategory of risks over the last two to three years? And the last two to three years really have been an exponential increase in interest in this in the fixed income community globally. And this slide shows you one of the main drivers of why that is occurring. And it's being driven by asset owners who are increasingly asking their asset managers who invest the funds for them to report on these factors. And it's, for them, it's about being able to be seen to do good as well as do well. And you can see from this graph that um, back in 2017, about 50%, 55% of um, asset owners were actually using ESG policies that asset managers held to help them decide which asset managers to select. But in the last year or so, that's increased now to over 86% of asset owners are expecting their asset managers to have some kind of ESG assessment framework when they're creating um, investment instruments that will hold bonds of people like yourselves. And then in terms of how they assess the actual performance of the asset managers and monitor the performance of the investments that are made on their behalf, you can see that, again, that's also increased from 2017 to 2018 by about 25%. It's now about 78% of all asset owners. And by asset owners, we mean people like the pension funds, the insurance companies, um, which are gathering in the deposits to be invested in corporate bonds such as the ones that yourselves issue. So that's a very big driver, and that's led asset managers to start to look at the investments they're making in, in corporate bonds in particular, and to say, actually, what are the influences of ESG risks on the performance of these bonds? And here is just a little snapshot of the level of global assets under management, which are now ESG principles invested. And you can see that it's, it's reached a stage where over $30 trillion of assets under management out of about 90 trillion are now being ESG principles invested. So this is important and it's increasing quite rapidly. Um, back in um, 2017, that figure was, it, it's about, I think, 34%, something like that now. Back in 2017, it was around about 26, 27%. So it's increasing rapidly. But then if you actually look at the investors who own those sort of $89.7 trillion of, of assets, actually 88% of them have some form of sustainable impact or ESG policy now. And so ESG practices are very much becoming part and parcel of the standardized way in which investors look at companies when they're deciding whether or not to allocate funds to them. So what about credit rating agencies and, and where does all that come into uh, the uh, rapid rise of interest in, in ESG? Well, up until about the uh, end of 2018, the big three credit rating agencies, ourselves, Moody's, and S&P, we were all basically saying the same thing, which is, look, if these risks are material, then they're included within our analysis. But I think quite rightly, investors were saying, okay, that's fine, but you have a 156-page criteria on how you analyze corporate entities, which aspects of that are important from an ESG perspective. And so it's essentially, they, through the UNPRI, started to apply pressure to the rating agencies to say, look, we need more detail and transparency around the following aspects. We want you to assess material ESG characteristics at a sector level. We want to know what's relevant for a sector. We also want to know if it is relevant for a sector, how material is it for an individual issuer? And how is it affecting each issuer? And we'd also like you to identify what are systemic risks um, from ESG in, in the markets in which you're producing ratings. And so at the uh, beginning of 2018, we set about looking at how we could extract these risks from our existing criteria and display them as a subcategory uh, separately, and how we could very clearly articulate if an individual aspect of environmental, social, or governance risk was impacting a rating, and if it was impacting a current rating, 
then what was the magnitude of that impact? Was it causing a notch change to the rating? Was it causing a change in outlook, a change in watch? Or was it just that in combination with some other factors, it was leading to an overall change? And so we set about doing that during the course of 2018 and started publishing our, our scores on this from the beginning of 2019, so the beginning of this year. So we've got some very good feedback on that so far. This is a, a, this is a quote from a US asset manager that we presented this to back in April of this year where after we'd launched our corporate ESG relevant scores in January 2017. And I think we were expecting that it might take a little bit more time for the, the investors to become interested because they'd want to see time series data. But what we realized when we published this is what we were doing was the first time somebody had actually looked at the E, S, and the G from a pure credit perspective and said, okay, let's put aside good or bad. Let's focus on how relevant is this to, a, to the forecasts of a company over the same period as credit rating, so a two to five year forecast period. How much are these factors influencing the decision on credit? Not how good or bad is, is the level of carbon emissions, is the company for the environment, but if you look at those aspects, how much does it really affect the credit profile of the companies? Are they managing these risks so that it has a minimal impact on their profiles, or are they actually suffering some form of credit impact from these individual risks? So what we did was we set about creating templates on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, and this is an example of one here. Um, if you're a rated entity by ourselves, you will have seen this because you will have one of these for, for your company, and we've published them now for every entity that we rate across all sectors. And as a very brief explanation, we have a set of general risk categories for environment, social, and governance, which are the same across all sectors. And then we identify next to that the sector-specific risk issues that are credit relevant for that aspect of environmental, social, or governance risk. So, for example, in automotive manufacturers, under greenhouse gas emissions and air quality, emissions from the vehicle fleet being sold is the key credit aspect from, from our perspective. And so we've gone through and we've worked through nearly 100 sectors globally, over 51 individual corporate sectors, creating these templates. And those sector-specific issues show you what the analysts are primarily interested in. And then alongside that, you have a score from one to five. And to give you an example of how our scoring system works, at a score of five, it's an individual element of environmental, social, or governance risk, which unambiguously by itself is causing a change to the current rating. So maybe your rating is triple B plus instead of A minus because of a specific issue. And our analysts are now able to tell you exactly what that impact is if there is, is uh, an elevated score. So we have at, the, at, the, at one extreme, we have an elevated score of five, which is individual aspects of ES or G risk causing a change to the current rating. Then we have a score of four, which is aspects which um, in conjunction with other things lead to changes in the rating. Then a neutral score, which is where things are minimally relevant from a credit perspective, but um, or, or they're being managed actively by issuers so that they don't impact their credit profiles. A really good example of that is if you look at our ratings on natural resources companies globally, you'll see that the ratings suffer more impact from governance and social issues than they do from environmental issues. That's not because they're not polluting entities, but it's because the, the companies in this sector in particular are good at understanding and managing those environmental risks so it doesn't impact their credit profile. Again, we're not trying to make a judgment on how good or bad the companies are. We're merely looking at the impact on, on their credit profiles. There's a lot more detail on this on our website at fitchratings.com forward slash ESG, which goes into a detailed breakdown of how the scores are composed, um, looks at different sectors, looks at influences on sectors, etc. So on the next slide, I just wanted to, to show you a summary of what we've done so far this year. And this includes what we're about to publish tomorrow morning, which is structured finance transactions. But essentially, by the end of Thursday this week, we will be publishing ESG relevant scores for over 10,000 entities and transactions. And they're being monitored and maintained by our credit analysts in the ratings business. 
and there are either 14 or 15 individual scores for each entity. So that's coming up for 142,000 odd scores, 50,000 odd environmental scores, 50,000 social, 41 and a half governments. Um, having done that, what does it actually show? Does it actually show that there is impact from, from ESG and credit? Well, if, I, if you look at, take a quick look at the next slide. You'll recall that I said we have a neutral score at three, and then we have drivers at a level of four and key drivers at five. Those key drivers are individual aspects changing ratings. The drivers are contributory factors. And if you look at the universe of corporate entities that we've published these on so far, you can see that 22% of the companies that we rate are suffering some form of impact from environmental, social, and governance factors in their, in their ratings. So that's 22% of entities that have either one or more score of four or five. Those elements that un unambiguously change the rating, the scores of five, they're actually quite a small proportion. They're about 2.7% of overall entities. So that 22% breaks down into 2.7% and 19.3. But if you look at where that impact is coming from, if you look at the um, chart on the right, you'll see that the majority of the impact is coming from governance, followed by social factors and followed by environmental factors. And we're producing quite a lot of research that, that looks at how this affects different individual sectors. It is interesting, there is definitely a difference between developed markets and emerging markets. This is a quick summary of developed markets. The total is at the bottom right. And you can see governance and social factors are playing a, a fairly even um, fairly even um, role in influencing credit ratings across all of the sectors combined with environment coming in in third. That pattern looks the same for the US, for developed market Americas, US and Canada. It looks slightly different for Asia. There's a lot, a lot less environmental impact. And for de developed market Europe, actually social is having a greater impact on credit ratings than governance or environmental. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is there are quite a large number of entities within Europe in um, sectors which are suffering from social preference trend impacts. So things like healthcare, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, where social preferences and trends are, are having an impact on, on credit profiles. And the other is that there's actually, um, it's harder for corporates to manage these types of issues in Europe in particular as governments react very quickly to populist opinion. So we've seen earlier this year you know, um, outcries about obesity and the sudden imposition of sugar taxes on food manufacturers. So those sorts of aspects make it hard for companies to plan and predict um, what will happen in the, in the sector. If we take a very quick look at emerging markets, you'll see it's all about governance. And in fact, environmental is slightly more important than, than social there, but it's governance that, that dominates. There's a lot of information about this on our, on our website. Um, and that includes, sorry, I think we just paused on that slide, and, and, and that includes different sectors. So here, this is a summary of the financial institution sector. You'll see there, it's similar to corporates. It's about 20% overall, but it's significantly different in that the majority of impact comes from governance when you're looking at banks, insurance companies, and non-bank financial institutions. We've done this and worked across pretty much all of the sectors. Um, and so now we have sector templates for coming up for 100 different sectors across structured finance, infrastructure, public finance, both revenue supported and tax supported, across insurance, banks, MBFIs, sovereigns, and all the various different corporate sectors. So essentially from um, the second quarter of next year, you'll find that everything that we rate has an ESG relevant score attached to it. So at this stage, I will pass over to Mervyn, who will talk about what this actually means and, and the sort of practical implications and, and a few interesting case studies. Yeah, uh, thanks, Andrew. So. Um, one of the benefits of creating these ESG relevant scores for us is that we're collecting a huge amount of data that 
is also evolving over time. So it helps us track and understand how uh, ESG issues impact credit ratings. So with this information, we can use the scores to understand when a rating action is driven by an ESG issue and when it's not. And we can systematically analyze these scores to understand sector and regional trends that affect ESG, uh, that are um, driven by ESG issues. I think one of the more useful ways, I think, to il illustrate um, what um, Andrew said is to talk about a few examples of ESG score, relevant scores that have changed since we introduced them in January. So I'm going to highlight, uh, going to go through four examples, which I think highlights just the breadth of ESG issues there are, and also the variety of ways that it can impact credit ratings. Here's, an here's four examples of where we have had um, relevant scores change. And the first example I want to discuss is CoreCivic, which is a US private prison operator whose uh, credit rating was downgraded from double B plus to double B in July. Now, the, downgraded, uh, the downgrade reflected um, the fact that a list of banks in the US publicly announced plans to withdraw lending and financial services to the company, uh, weakening its capital access. Now, if you looked at the ESG relevance score for um, exposure to social impact, um, we actually increased this from three to four in April uh, when these concerns started to materialize. I think this example is interesting for a few reasons. I think the first is that the credit impact is not actually driven by regulatory, regulation or policy issues, uh, policy decisions, as it often is with um, some of the ESG issues that we look at. But the consequences of ESG considerations uh, being a bigger part of uh, the actions of financial market actors. Banks have increasing ESG concerns. Um, uh, over uh, what prison operate, private prison operators are doing, and they're, doing, uh, they're reflecting that in their lending. Now, the, I think one of the interesting side of this is that actually with U.S. private prisons, they actually have benefited from policymaking and uh, regulation uh, over the last, um, uh, last year, but actually um, they've been downgraded because of ESG concerns. The second thing I think is interesting about this example is that the impact of ESG issues need to be considered with the overall credit profile. So the reason why um, um, a, a private prisons in the US um, are more sensitive to funding issues than other REITs is because they lack the ability to access secure property mortgages. And so they are more reliant on bank and debt capital markets. And that's reflected in our analysts' um, decisions for the scores and the um, credit rating. The next example I want to go through is uh, Forexpo, um, the iron ore mining company with operations in Ukraine. Um, so in May, Fitch um, downgraded the management and governance factor score, uh, which is an input to the credit rating. But the overall impact, uh, there was no overall impact on the credit rating itself. Now, at the same time, the ESG relevance scores for governance structure, group structure, and financial transparency uh, were also increased from three to four, which indicates that there's an issue. Uh, uh, these issues, in combination with other factors, have had some impact on the credit rating. And if you talk to our analysts, the way they would communicate uh, this is that the, the, the change in score reflects the resignation of the statutory auditor uh, and three independent directors. So that affects board independence, hence governance structure, and then also financial transparency because of what happened with the auditor. These issues uh, or resonations relate to the investigation on whether a charity the company donated to is a related party through the CEO. So that would be a group structure issue. Um, when we've looked at this systematically, it's interesting that we often see governance issues when they impact the credit rating materialize in combinations with each other. So when you see complex group structure or group structure issues um, for an issuer, you also often see um, a lack of um, financial transparency uh, and related party transactions. Um, so that, um, and, and that's particularly common in emerging markets in terms of financial transparency.
The third example I want to go through is um, Arizona Public Service, um, which um, had its um, rating outlook changed to negative uh, in July, uh, reflecting regular initiatives to re-examine retail customer choices and review the implementation of retail rates. Now, the ESG relevance score, um, the, the uh, for um, two social scores, uh, one for human rights, community relations, uh, access and affordability, and customer welfare, um, and then the other for fair messaging, privacy, and data security. Both of those increased from three to a four, indicating that they had some impact on the credit rating. Now, um, the reason why um, some of these regulatory initiatives start to take place is due to the customer complaints of excessive bills that the company was facing um, following the implementation of time of use rates. Um, regulators also found that the customer education and outreach profile um, uh, of the company, um, uh, so uh, the outreach efforts were insufficient, um, which led to increased scrutiny of um, the business. And so now um, the regulators are considering opening up the market uh, and allowing um, consumers to choose independent power provider, uh, power providers, which is affecting um, potentially uh, competition in the future. Now. This is an example um, of an ESG issue um, related to customer complaints. And what you might find uh, in the ESG industry and what investors are looking at is they're trying to find ways to uh, think about uh, how they can um, find more data to um, potentially preempt this. So they're looking at customer complaints data. They're looking at complaints policies. They're looking at many more issues, uh, many more pieces of data to try and get a grasp of these ESG issues. My final example is um, Yida China Holdings Limited, a home building company in China. Um, I wanted to use this example because the score, uh, ESG score for operational execution changed from three to a five. And the five means that that ESG issue alone uh, was the key rating driver for the rating decision. And in July, um, the credit rating for this company was downgraded from B- minus to triple C. Now, um, this reflected the company's liquidity risk, but um, when it comes to what our analyst was trying to communicate with the score um, for um, operating execution, one of the reasons is that there's a lack of a comprehensive uh, plan to improve its debt maturity structure. And the analyst expects that there'll be significant uncertainty over um, the company's business execution. And so here are four examples, I think, which I think highlight just the variety of ESG issues that can impact credit ratings. And what we're doing from a research perspective is getting these scores, um, trying to understand if it's uh, the particular issues in specific countries, in specific sectors, uh, and trying to get a, um, create analytical insights out of them. I'll leave it for now and then um, start moving to questions and answers. Okay, that's great. We've got um, quite a few questions, and I guess, um, Andrew, one for you is around how we see this manifesting itself globally. So looking at China, the US, how do we see ESG being um, considered from those you know, different jurisdictions? Um, are you talking there about for sovereigns uh, as, a, as an asset class, or are you talking about or are there differences between countries as well as regions for sectors? Uh, I think really how, both how you know, you're looking at different countries, if you look sure. at them differently, uh, and also how the companies themselves culturally are responding. Um, yeah. I, I mean, one of the most important things to, to recognize about the work that we're doing is it is fully integrated with our ratings, and this is, this is significantly different from either of our competitors. And it's also, as a product, it's significantly different from the scores that you see from people like Sustainalytics or from MSCI, where you know, the linkage to credit and the impact on credit is missing, basically. And so the reason we developed this and, and, and we went about doing this was to provide that missing piece of information to investors in the market. And we have done this across everything from government-owned entities, from municipalities, regional government cities, and right through to the sovereigns, sovereigns themselves. And what it does show you is different levels of impact, um, depending on what type of entity you're dealing with. So for instance, if you look at um, the 118 sovereign entities that we rate around the world, 
um, there is material impact from ESG for 100% of those entities, mainly because governance is a strong driving factor in the rating of a, a sovereign entity. Um, sovereigns are quite complex because they don't act in a market where they're competing with each other. And so the scores for sovereigns tend to be more absolute. Is governance a factor when you're assessing the risk of this entity or not? Um, and it's harder to make comparisons. We're working on greater granularity, but that probably involves methodological changes. A, a lot of sovereign data is quite time lagged, and also people tend to use aggregated information through World Bank indicators and stuff like that to measure sovereign risk. But ultimately, you know, the, the, the short answer to your question is, is, yes, we see pervasive impact everywhere. It's interesting when you look at non-financial corporates, you look at financial institutions, you look at structured finance, it's around about a fifth of entities and transactions which are being impacted by these factors. I mean, it is fair to say that a large number of these risk aspects are being actively managed so that they don't impact the financial profile. And again, I can't em emphasize enough, when we're looking at this, we are looking at the impact on credit, and so the impact on financial profiles of the entities. We are not concerning ourselves whether they are increasing carbon emissions or decreasing carbon emissions. We only care about that if it has a financial consequence for their forecast in the next two to five years. So again, we're not making moral judgments. We're just saying when it comes down to it, what's the reality from a financial perspective from these factors? Is it going to cause a difference over the next two to five years? And again, that's a, that's a source of information that's been missing in the market so far. And for, for many of the people listening in the Treasury is there trying to understand what they can do to influence their ESG rating. Is, do you think there's enough transparency to help them understand what they could or should be doing, both as a company, what their peers are doing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean it's interesting because you mentioned the ESG rating. We actually don't provide an ESG rating. We provide a, a score that looks at relevance and materiality of ESG to the credit ratings for that entity. And the reason we've done that is precisely the, the sort of background to your, to your question, which is if you look at a lot of these ESG ratings, it's very difficult to work out what the component parts are and therefore what you should or shouldn't be doing um, if, you're a, if you're a corporate. Um, but what we've tried to do is we've tried to isolate the credit aspects. So if you're a corporate and you look at our templates, if you look at the rating that we've provided on you, you will be able to see for your industry sector what our analysts are interested in from an ESG perspective when it comes to credit. You'll be able to see whether or not any of those aspects are actually impacting your credit profile. And theoretically, you can have a, a, a nice discussion with somebody like a Sustainalytics or an MSCI to say, yeah, that's fine. You're telling me this issue is material to me as an entity. But actually, when I look at the Fitch scores, it says there isn't any impact on my credit profile over the next two to five years. So what's your view on that? How are you, you know, you're saying it's material, you're saying maybe there's a reason people shouldn't invest in my, my company, but actually there doesn't seem to be a financial impact. So how are you looking at that? What time frame are you considering to, to, to bring that risk to bear? And again, you know, time frame is important, and what we're doing doesn't replace what other people have started to do in this market, but it provides cross comparable consistency and clarity. So you can look at it, and, and if you have nothing on there, it may be that it's because your industry isn't particularly affected, or it may be that you're very, like a, some of the natural resources companies, you're actually very good at managing it so it doesn't have a, a financial impact. Okay, and um, you, you've mentioned people like MSCI and State Analytics. Um, where are we on the, trying to get a more consistent approach and the view around what is green, what is light green, what's quite dirty brown? Well, that, that, that comes to a whole different aspect, which is labeling of, of bonds. And I mean, from a pure credit perspective, we see no real difference between a green bond and a brown bond. Ultimately, you know, the, the things we are interested in is whether it has an impact on, on the credit aspects of the business, not how moral or ethical it is, or necessarily application of processes, uh, proceeds, unless there's a, a credit aspect to it. And um, 
just a broad question around governance. How, how do you assess governance? Because that's quite a well, government. Bizarrely enough, for, for, for rating agencies generally, governance is something which they've been focused on for a very long time. And so, for, for us, when we produce these templates, and again, these templates look at five environmental categories, they look at five social categories, four governance categories. Those four governance categories are the same as the governance criteria that we've had in place for well over a, over a decade. And governance is extreme is extremely important because what you tend to see is it has a knock on impact. Often you'll see governance issues emerging before they translate into a social impact issue or an environmental impact issue. And we're doing some research to look at how that varies be between sectors. But governance is kind of one of those things which is also unidirectional. Superb, fantastic best practice governance. Um, doesn't get you a higher rating, but poorer governance will get you a, low, a lower credit rating. Um, so, you know, meeting thresholds and standards for the industry that you're in is extremely important. And companies go through a lot of work in terms of benchmarking and implementing best practice on that. And in governance, we look at, at various different, different aspects. I mean, I could start to go into the, the detail on the criteria, but I don't think that's going to be particularly interesting to people at this point. But presumably there is, if, if people wanted to learn a bit more about how you looked yep. at, uh, how you considered great uh, governance, uh, you've got plenty of yep, we, we, there's, there's specific governance criteria that you can access free from our general website, and that looks at how we treat different aspects of governance by looking at and saying, well, is it neutral to the rating? And the best position you can have is neutral, and then it's sort of getting worse from that point onwards. Okay. Uh, question for you, Andrew. You shared with us some examples of uh, some companies that have challenges. Do you have any uh, UK or European examples that you could uh, share with the audience? Um, yes, and I, I think we have, we have a couple of questions which are also asking about positive and asking about where uh, whether it can be positive as well as negative. The answer is yes, it can be positive. If it's positive, it has a little plus sign by it. Because unfortunately, we're credit analysts, so we're naturally pessimistic. So most of the stuff is looking at downside and downside risks. Um, but a good example, so, so let's use water and wastewater management uh, as an example. A good example of a sector within the UK where water and wastewater management could be positive or it could be negative is the regulated UK water utility sector. And there, the, the pricing mechanism from the regulator has a very clear link to meeting water loss reduction targets. If you fail to meet those, then you, know, you can pick up some very heavy fines. Um, I think there's a, there's a subsidiary of Thames Water which picked up about 280 million pounds worth of fines in, in the last pricing period. And that leads to more stringent um, rating going, uh, sorry, that leads to more stringent regulation going forwards. And so that can result in your rating being impacted and having a score of, uh, one of those high scores of five. But conversely, if you outperform on reducing water leakage from your transmission system, you can earn additional revenues. And so that would be a good example where you could pick up a positive score of four or maybe even a positive score of five if you significantly outperformed. Where you see positive scores tends to be in sectors where there is either some form of regulatory ring fencing around revenues or cash flows that provides you know, higher levels of profitability or more secure revenue streams. Um, some feed-in tariffs, for instance, for renewable energy businesses um, provide a more stable and higher level of profitability than market-driven um, energy production in, in renewables, and so they might be considered to be more, more favorable. Um, so, so there are a number of different examples, but it tends to be where you have those structural aspects that support the credit profiles. Okay, that's great. We've got, a, I think, five more minutes, and we've still more questions coming through. Um, unsolicited um, ESG ratings, do they occur? Do it, it, it's not possible for us to do the scores that we're doing without producing a credit rating as well. And you know, to be honest, the ESG relevant schools would be quite meaningless without the rating because what we're looking at is we're looking at how the rating is being influenced by, by these factors. Um, it's not a choice for an issuer 
to decide to have the ESG relevant score with their rating, they'll get it automatically. Right. And similarly, they can't choose not to have it either. Um, again, it's an observation on how much this subcategory of risks has affected the overall rating decision. Interestingly, when we published these, um, there was very little reaction from corporate issuers, mainly positive because they said it's refreshing just to see the pure credit aspect of this. But where they were picking up scores of five or scores of four, it largely was stuff that we were writing about and talking about anyway, so none of it was a surprise. Um, it's sort of a broader question, both from, uh, I guess, reflecting from the audience from oil and gas and uh, sort of tobacco industries as well. How do you look at potential future issues, um, given the sort of nature of their businesses? Okay, so maybe um, I think we can probably just squeeze in a, a quick example of, uh, if, if I run you through a very fast example of how the scores could change over time, I think that will give you some insight into that. So if we took water and wastewater management, we've already talked about that. If we look at that and we looked at, say, the airline sector, and if you look at the airline sector, water and wastewater management, from a credit ratings perspective, it would pick up, all airlines globally at the moment will pick up a score of one for water and wastewater management. It's conceptually incon inconceivable that they would ever see their credit profiles impacted by water and wastewater management. They do consume water, they do produce and emit wastewater into the atmosphere, but it's never going to impact their credit profiles. If airline regulators came out and said, actually, we're going to regulate the emissions that you dump into the atmosphere as you fly around, you'd see the score for the entire sector move from a two from a one to a two for all of the entities in the sector. It's now relevant to the sector. It's not relevant to any entities because it's not affecting any credit profiles yet. If then the regulators nine months later came out and said, here's the detailed technical regulations, and by the way, if you transgress these, you're going to get fined 3% of revenues. You'll then see the relevant scores that we have for water and wastewater management for airlines dispersing between threes, fours, and fives. If we thought an airline was well prepared to demonstrate compliance, wasn't going to pick up fines, had systems processes in place that could demonstrate that, they'd pick up a score of three. They're managing it effectively to ensure there's no impact on their credit profile. Maybe we'd have another airline that had to spend some capex on putting in place processes and procedures to report on compliance, but we were confident that they were compliant. That might reduce their headroom in their ratings for maybe 12 to 18 months as they spent the capex, wouldn't change the rating, they'd pick up a score of four for that. It's having an impact, but it's not changing the rating. And then if somebody had to change their operating processes, put in place policies and procedures, we thought they were going to get fined, then you'll see them going on a watch, an outlook, or getting downgraded, and they'd pick up a score of five. Now, I have emphasized that what we're doing at the moment looks at a forward-looking two- to five-year period. That's important. A lot of the scores you get at the moment are point-in-time or backwards-looking. Um, but so the number of what this question, I think, is about is how do you then take into account transition risk? How do you take into account long-term changes in linearity of climate-related events, those types of aspects? This is embedded with the analysts who are doing the credit ratings, and so they are constantly monitoring and updating their analysis, and so it's on a rolling basis. So as these things come nearer to the horizon, they'll start to impact, they'll start to come in through that route of ones, twos, then into threes, building up to fours and fives. Um, so we look at we look at um, things like transition risk um, through scenario analysis, and we'll look at individual sectors or we'll look at individual aspects, policy changes, perhaps that can affect a number of different sectors around carbon pricing, that type of thing. But they're not the base case scenarios that we, we base the ratings on unless we can envisage an impact within that two to five year period. That's brilliant. We've, um, we've got many more questions. We, we can't go through all of them. It's clearly an issue that is uh, really important to help understand uh, how, organi how organizations like yourselves are responding. Uh, it's helped me understand a bit more about the differences and the sort of key considerations. Uh, I think we could go on for a couple more hours with the questions we've got. Um, we, we will be publishing, I think we'll be sharing the slides. Yep, the, the slides also have quite a detailed appendices in them that look at a breakdown by sector of some of the different issues to do with environmental, to do with social, to do with governance. They also look at comparing some of the, the governance aspects. 
all of the stuff that we are publishing on this and have published so far this year is available free on our website. Um, you have to go to pitchracings.com forward slash ESG. It'll ask you to register, but once you've registered, you'll be able to see all of the ESG stuff. And that includes the raw data on all the issues, so the 14 scores or 15 scores for every issue. You can download that in an Excel sheet. You can also download lots of graphs and charts that compare sectors and look at um, differences between regions. Some of those charts that I showed you earlier on for lots and lots of different sectors. That's brilliant. And this recording itself will be available in a couple of days. I think people will be getting emails once it's been uploaded onto the, the website. Um, as I said, thank you very much for joining it. We joining this webinar. The ACT has got a number of resources, and I want to just highlight that our annual conference next year uh, in Wales will have as its theme balancing risk, champion sustainable growth. Please take time to fill in the survey as the feedback you provide is very helpful to us when arranging future events. And um, finally, I'd like to say thank you to Andrew and to Mervyn for joining us from Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you.